right, so how in the world can me in my mortal life actually prove out my salvation to myself and to others? If all these rules and regulations are correct, I'm not supposed to contend for the faith, so I'm not I'm supposed to be silent. Otherwise, I might create some contention, uh, or somebody might doubt their faith, or uh, whatever I believe is not necessarily what you believe. Where's God in all of this? Nowhere. For example, in 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 9, we started out, consider another passage, which if pulled out of context and falsely cited, condemns the active and faithful Christian who testifies a lie in public. He, it is falsely maintained, who testifies in public about the doctrine of eternal life is conceited. Oh and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions. Now notice, it's falsely maintained that this is the one in view is the one who testifies in public of the doctrine of eternal life. But it doesn't say that. Guess what you have to do? You have to read from the beginning to the end the whole passage. And then you get the context. Let's read some more, starting earlier, three through six, three through nine. Because isolation of one verse apart from the context does not do God's word justice. To consider from verses three through nine. Verse three: If anyone advocates a different doctrine, something that isn't scriptural, and does not agree with sound words, oh, there you. Go. Paul is saying sound words, and that is what they actually mean according to how the words are used. A dictionary. Lexicons were available back in the first century as well. In many different languages. So, and those of our Lord Jesus Christ, the words of his, and with a doctrine conforming to godliness. Notice that the subject of this passage is those who espouse false doctrine, not those who argue for the truth of the gospel itself, the words of our Lord, and stand firm in doing so. So he who teaches such false doctrine, is it scriptural, is conceited and understands nothing. I, how, come, how come when I have an argument with somebody, I say, look, I'm willing to be proved wrong. Just show me where I'm wrong. And I'll, I'll be obedient and, and change my thinking. But they don't even want to do that. They don't care. They care so little about that. They, all they want to do is to beat you down and shut you up and be uh, distanced from you. So... He who teaches such false doctrine is conceited and understands nothing. But he who has but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. I'm accused of this. I dispute about words. Yes, I dispute that the word in John three sixteen is not future tense, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should never perish, but will have if they keep on believing eternal life. It doesn't say that. So I'm disputing the words. But this is not a false doctrine. I'm debating the faith, the contending for the actual what the words actually say. Well I can say what I want to, what it what I wanted to say, but that's not how God inspired it. Who's in charge here? Can you be an editor? So I'm conceited, I understand nothing, I have a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which Arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. Interestingly enough, those things come out of the people that are telling me I have these problems and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. So am I deprived? I'm speaking for the truth unless you can prove me wrong. Let's go to Scripture and say, what does present tense mean here? Is it present tense or is it not? See, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So who supposes that godliness is the means of gain? This passage is referring to those who teach that being prosperous is a reflection of one's godliness. So it's not talking about doctrinal truth and arguing for that, contending for that. It does re not refer to believers who stand firm in the defense of the gospel. This passage goes on to teach that being content with what one has is the issue and not striving to get God to make them prosperous or condemning other faithful believers who are not materially successful for their supposed lack of godliness. Back down 
network. Down the Prado to the traffic circle. Another restroom. No, it's closed. It's right there, but it's closed. Go down the street to this traffic circle. Find a restaurant. Go to the second floor. Be be empty and clean. Okay. Excuse me for that. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Verse 6, but Paul goes on to say that it is not riches which reflect the believer's godliness, but his contentment with whatever is his situation. We have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And we have food and covering with those we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So those who advocate the false doctrine of being guaranteed riches as a result of so-called godly behavior will fall into eventual ruin and destruction, not those who truly argue for the actual truth of God's word. Furthermore, contending for the faith is actually a scriptural truth. It's amazing. You quote the verse and give the verse citation, Jude 3 to 4 and Philippians 1, 27 to 28, and they look at you, oh, I don't know. No, it's not there. Well, read it. See, ask him to read it for you. Sometimes I think I should bring a Bible with me, but its uh, I just keep forgetting. Just open it up and let's read it. But then they'll probably say you've got the bad version. There's always some reason why your testimony is faulty. So, let's look at Titus 3, 4 to 10. And I got told if I didn't leave the area, I would be physically beaten up and dragged out of the area. Titus 3, 4 to 10. But when the kindness and love of our God, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having no, the hope of eternal life. This is pretty good. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things, Paul writes, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And here's where the dark days come. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. What's the saying? It's saying, if I'm arguing for justification by grace through faith, that's not foolish controversy or a genealogy or an argument and a quarrel about the law. Warn a divisive person once. I was warned twice in that case. And then warn him the second time. And after that, have nothing to do with him. I wasn't even allowed to finish a sentence in defense of myself. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. This Notice that there is a kind of argument which is based on an unscriptural reasoning, which is therefore divisive, since they are over matters which are not or cannot be proved by Scripture, are thus foolish and unprofitable. Well, was I talking about that? No, I said, I'm just talking about Jesus and him crucified. One is to depart from such a conversation. On the other hand, this does not exclude proper arguing with content and godly reasoning, which is scriptural, is sound teaching. So look at verses 8 in 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14 as well. Romans 16, 17, 18, I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Notice that the issue is not whether one is contending or arguing, but whether one is teaching contrary to what they have learned from Paul. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. So when I, when I profess and contend for the doctrine of faith alone and Christ alone, which I can prove out from Scripture, am I divisive? Yeah, yeah, it could be. Do I have an appetite? No, unless I'm hungry for food. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Just twisting it to get me to shut up and leave. Well, they bring up the subject, and we kind of bring on the conversation. As soon as they find out I'm a different point of view, it's, it's, they say I'm leaving. I should leave because I'm divisive. And notice that it is by smooth, deceptive, flattering talk, which is self-serving and not an argumentative mode, that is in view here. Now, there are passages, however, which command the believer to contend for the faith. 1 Peter 
But you believers are commanded to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, set apart from all things in your mentality, in your mind, make it your absolute priority to live first and foremost under the Lordship, the commands of Jesus Christ, which are found in the Bible. Being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now, does that sound, that's what I'm doing? Why am I being condemned for that and, and attacked? Asks you. In other words, anyone who asks or calls for or desires or requires indicates that one communicates the need for an answer in some way. Now, suppose they don't have a need for that. Well, a lot of times they have a place where you can discuss things, and then they might ask you a question to verify where you're coming from, so you answer the question from Scripture. Notice that a direct question is not necessarily required. Only that there is a real perception that there is a required answer to the hope that is in the believer. And this means not only just being already living right, but actually speaking out the answer in defense of what God has said in his word in response to a perceived need to have that answer firmly but gently with an awesome reverence for the truth that you are representing to everyone, believers and unbelievers alike. Very often I finish a, a conversation, my last words are, uh, you know, you brought it up. I, I didn't. I would come up to them and talk about something, and they would philosophize or, or even share their faith with me, and then I would respond. But I, I don't have to respond with an amen if I don't think it's amen. We can have a discussion about it. We go to Scripture and resolve it that way. But Then they say, no, get out. You're not allowed to do this. You're being divisive. Well, why is that? And and you're not allowed to talk, talk about these subjects. I said, you, you brought the subject up. So objectors to contending for the faith with the believers must admit that even believers can at times lose sight of their sure hope of eternal life. And that's the danger of living in this world and once more allowing oneself to become part of it. Ephesians 5, 1 to 17 is a good passage on that. So when the window of opportunity opens, the mature believer has his duty to make a defense to everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. This often happens when the disoriented believers express a doubt about his salvation, even denying the doctrine of eternal security. This opens up the window of opportunity to the prepared, mature believer to respond with a defense from the words of God's word. For example, in Bible Knowledge Commentary, Christians should always be prepared, ready to give reason. Apologian is like an argument. The defense which a defendant must make before a judge for their hope in Christ, such an oral defense should be consistent with one's set-apart conduct. So it is not just conduct which a believer is to witness with, but he is to actively answer the inevitable questions which arise in his daily life, including at the workplace. So 1 Peter 3.15, just quoted above, stresses the importance of being ready to have an answer, being ready to make a defense to make a stand for what God says in his word. Peter implies here that truths from God's word are not usually readily received such that, that they do require defense, yet with gentleness and reverence. And other passages support this conclusion as well. More on this next time.